Welcome everyone. So today, Matt and I, from the perspective of privacy and technology transactions, are going to be talking about things we've seen in exit events when one company is trying to sell itself to a buyer. And we're going to talk about things that we've seen uh, done wrong and where we've seen companies uh, make life more complicated for themselves than perhaps they need to. So our agenda today is, uh, let's switch the slide. So the agenda is, um, we're going to give an overview of the sell side M&A process first and how the issues we're talking about can have an impact on that process, including discussions of data breach, uh, invalid IP assignments, post-closing data transfer issues. You might question why would that impact me as a seller, but it can, we'll get into that. Open source software, uh, data use and post-closing data use issues, technology escrows, uh, data sale issues, managed communication service uh, and license continuity and privacy notices. Obviously in any, any particular transaction, there can be different um, issues in context. This is not an exhaustive list of issues you might face in a transaction for your company, depending on your context, but we felt like there was some general validity to these issues that tend to cut across a very wide range of deals and, and cause issues in those deals. So let's look at the next slide. So let's talk about the uh, sell side M&A process. So I realized that some people here may have previously been through an exit event. Some people may never have been through an exit event. So for those folks, I'm going to lay out an architectural view of what happens when you sell your company. So first you build your business into something that's attractive for sale. And then you uh, pray and hope and you, you find a willing buyer and congratulations. And then at that point you sign a letter of intent and the letter of intent typically requires, uh, enables the buyer to conduct a diligence there may be a period that's defined for that diligence. Um, that may you may have some of the deal terms defined in that letter. And at that point, the diligence process really kicks off in earnest. And you'll find yourself subject to interview requests, document production requests um, from the buyer, from the buyer's counsel or representatives from consultants that the buyer may have hired. And they're going to be asking you questions about every area of your business. Of course, today we're focusing on privacy and technology. Then you have the purchase agreement negotiation. There will be an agreement that, that is defined between the parties where the buyer agrees to give you money for your company. And in exchange, the buyer is going to extract from you, the seller, a a lot of representations and warranties about the state and operation of your business. They may extract indemnities, they may extract uh, additional terms around liability, uh, but that, that's what the purchase agreement negotiation is about. Then you have, in a lot of deals, increasingly a level of review from an insurer. So buyers will often buy what's called reps and warranties insurance that's designed to protect their downside risk, at least to some extent, in these deals. And increasingly, those insurers take an active interest in the diligence. Typically, the insurer appears on the scene after substantial diligence has already been concluded by the buyer and the buyer's counsel and the buyer's uh, consultants who may have conducted a diligence. The insurer wants to understand what the process of diligence was what material issues may have been identified. And oftentimes the insurer will have their own point of view on what further questions need to be asked, what remediation may need to uh, occur. The insurers will also, are also interested in excluding issues from their insurance if the issue is serious enough and identified. 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say there with the insurance review, it's not insignificant. Uh, and generally when purchased, when there's gonna be insurance, the level of detail uh, questions and the digging from the purchaser is gonna be higher. Uh, so it's going to, it's almost itself, the insurer review is another mini diligence on the diligence process. And so uh, th that of course needs to be, we need to be mindful of that at, at the outset. Mm -hmm. Then there's, there's pre-closing remediation. So you may be asked as a seller to go back and fix items that have been identified in the diligence from the buyer. Uh, then there's the closing. Congratulations, buyer's gonna give you the money. You're gonna all sign the agreement. Unfortunately, though, closing is not always the end. You, as the seller, will take the position and want it to be the end. But there can be issues in the transaction related to uh, post-closing. In particular, if the, the buyer suddenly finds themselves in possession of materials or a company that they think is different than it's been represented to them or operationally it's not working the way they thought it was going to work. If the issues are serious enough there post-closing, the buyer will start to look for, uh, to advance their rights and remedies under the purchase agreement. And that may include indemnifications, liability, clawbacks, rescission, you know. You, so you don't want to be in that, in that situation where you're dealing with an upset buyer post-closing. So let's, look at um, what, what are the impacts, right? Um, failure to address these issues can impact your exit. So what are the typical kinds of impacts we see? One is more questions and scrutiny. You're just in for a harder diligence process. Uh, the buyer may start to hire increasing depth of subject matter expert or consultant to review your company, and you have to respond to all. So there's more time from your team. There's more effort trying to come up with answers to, to questions. Yeah, we see deal fatigue as a real uh, issue with sellers where uh, the initial diligence res uh, responses or, or uh, disclosures are, are, are not, not fully responsive or not at all responsive to the buyer's request. And that, and that means the buyer then digs even further and the timelines get extended and and uh, so deal fatigue is a real problem when uh, there's a non-production of, of requested documents or, or, or uh, information. Mm -hmm. uh, increased representations and warranties. The buyer's counsel is going to start insisting on tougher terms in the purchase agreement. Uh, unfavorable or unavailable underwriting. The insurer will start to carve out exclusions for coverage, which complicates the deal from the buyer's point of view because now the buyer has to take more risk to close the deal. Uh, they'll, the buyer will ask for special indemnities or insurance. That is the buyer may ask you as the seller to go out and acquire uh, an insurance policy of your own before the closing in order to, or, or, or to uh, yeah, work towards that. Pre-closing remediation, you might be forced to have very awkward discussions with your clients suddenly the diligence has uncovered a practice that really seems like an inadvisable practice and the buyer wants you to change that. And now you have to go back to your customers and explain, we're not going to be providing X service anymore, or maybe the buyer wants you to go and make disclosures to your customers you really don't want to make. Here's something we've been doing with your data that we never told you about before. So buyers will do that. Uh, if the issue is serious enough, they'll force you to have those conversations. Yeah, software development, rush software development jobs is another one that you'll see if there's problematic software that's being used in the, in the target company's um, assets. You know, they may be, the purchaser very well may require that that problematic component uh, be removed prior to, to prior to close. And that could be, a, obviously, that distracts your engineering resources from, from their day jobs. Yeah. Um, as well as potentially forcing you, another knock-on effect is to disclose this potential sale more widely in the company than you intended to in the first place. So now every employee knows that this sale is pending, which may not have been something you wanted. Um, lower valuations, of course, dead deal. I've seen deals die over license agreements that weren't up to snuff. 
right? Um, if it's a business where the licensing is crucial and fundamental and the buyer starts to have real questions about the adequacy of those agreements, the, the buyer, your buyer may have come to Jesus moment and say, look, we're, we're out, we're not touching this. And then of course, what I mentioned, clawbacks or indemnities, uh, post-closing can also be an issue. So Matt, why don't you tell us about um, how these issues might, might impact business to business companies? Yeah, so I, so just broadly first, if, you know, is privacy or technology diligence uh, an issue for your exit? The answer to that is almost always going to be yes, and that's especially if you own some technology or intellectual property assets uh, that you license to third parties, or really it could be a license from third parties too, and that's a material dependency in your business. Uh, also, you know, privacy diligence is relevant if you're handling, especially relevant if you're handling personal data from your customers, right? And, and keep in mind that the, the trend line with how the law uh, defines personal data is toward broader and not towards narrower. Yeah. So, so it's not just social security number that counts. It's name. It's uh, you know contact information, um, even IP address can count if it's associated with the consumer's device. The definitions are just really expanding. Right. So if you touch or handle any of that for your customers, right, or on your own behalf, you've got some data issue. And the question becomes how material is it to the, to the transaction? All right. So some of the issues, you know, I won't read um, all of these issues that we see very, com uh, very commonly in our deals on buy side and sell side. Failure to obtain title to the IP. The target company doesn't own, simply just doesn't own what it says that it owns. Um, it hasn't, the target company hasn't practiced responsible contract management, uh, contracting processes. So they've got liabilities under their contracts that are not treated, they're not mitigated, there's no disclaimers, there's not appropriate uh, liability caps and waivers, the indemnities might be extremely broad. You've got uh, anti-assignment or anti-change of control provisions that would require you to go get consent from what might be a very material vendor or a very material customer. And what we see all the time is these often are very large enterprises and the, the process by which you get consent from that vendor or that customer is very long and it doesn't fit within the time frame of the deal that the, the buyer is expecting, right? So a little bit of contract forethought in terms of your contract and thinking about your exit events when you're contracting will make a lot of sense and save you a lot of headaches during the process. We often see, uh, you know, in terms of open source use and, and management, we see companies that uh, that have copy left issues. That's one that I'll be part of a special issue that we'll dive, dive into a little bit more later. Um, uh, oftentimes, you know, if you do have a material supplier or a, a, a critical tech dependency, um, no contract or a contract that doesn't contemplate what the wind down process is, if that supplier or that a uh, few part ways with that uh, supplier or the dependency is no longer available to you. I should point out all of these issues can be issues on the B2C or B2C side. We're, the slide focuses on B2B because sometimes the sense is, oh, we're a B2B business. We don't have a direct relationship with consumers, at least on the privacy side. Privacy isn't our issue. And that's certainly not true on the privacy side. You'd probably be less likely to think that on the tech side, but it, we're here to tell you it's, it's an issue for all kinds of businesses. So um, is there a way to uh, naturally raise the question, as an initial strategy, does your business have a way to avoid privacy and cyber issues? Because you might think, maybe I can just make the exit easier on myself by finding a credible way to avoid privacy and cyber issues. And it can be a legitimate strategy. If you do have a way to construct your business to prevent uh, handling of, of personal data and the like, then maybe that, that is something to consider. So. If you really want to follow through on the strategy, though, things you're going to have to do are do not handle personal data from a regulated jurisdiction like California or Europe. 
um, do process personal data, do not process personal data on behalf of your customers. Do not share, trade, or sell, or make personal data available to your customers or your third parties. Um, don't ingest data from individuals in order to enhance or develop products or services. Don't enter into contracts or make representations around the handling of personal data. In other words, don't handle personal data at all. So if you can do that, if you can really uh, operate your business so that you're not handling personal data at all, then there, you may have a strategic way to avoid privacy uh, issues. There's probably some cyber security issue. You still need to have some basic decent information technology controls, but you could avoid one of these issues. So uh, otherwise, if this isn't your business, then ignoring these kinds of issues will po pose a deal uh, risk and also a compliance risk to your business. So uh, what are some of the things that a reasonable or typical um, sell side M&A process will, will include? So um, I was just looking at how much time I have because I could spend a lot of time on this slide, but I'll try not to overdo it. So, okay, so first you have to be able to speak to your data act. That means that you have to be able to describe what data you collect, what kinds of individuals or consumers it, it relates to, where that data is stored, how that data is transferred. Um, yeah, so, so you have to be able to provide the buyer and their representatives a clear picture of your data processing activities. Privacy notices. So I, I'm the privacy partner who, who chairs the privacy and cybersecurity group here at Morris Manning and, and Martin. If I have a junior associate, the one thing I can always have them do on a diligence competently is look at your public privacy notice. They're very good at spotting the, the representations you made that went too far, where you made promises you're probably not going to be able to live up to. For example, if you promise we will um, uh, never sell personal information and you're now trying to sell the company and there's no carve out exception for the M&A context. Like that's an automatic issue that, uh, that, that any first year lawyer at the firm can spot. So, so and it's an easy issue because all of this is public. I don't have to know anything about your business. I just have to know your website. I can find your notice on your website. And if that's missing obvious points or has obvious, obviously content that, that's problematic, that will get spotted. Vendor contracting. Depending on the transaction, there may be more or less attention paid to your vendors, but there's often it, 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 at least a question as to what processes you have internally to diligence your vendors and ensure that they're living up to uh, the obligations they need to in order to protect your data, have privacy controls in place, limit their use of your data for their own purposes and the like. Uh, customer contracting. So we always, this gets in my world when I'm on the buyer side, this always gets a, a reasonably decent look. We try to identify if the selling company has a practice of making privacy promises to its customers that may be operationally difficult to implement or impossible to implement. We also try to identify if the seller accepts unlimited liability around uh, its contracts. If it does, does it do so on a regular basis or is it an exceptional basis that it might accept unlimited liability around privacy or, or security? Another issue that will come up is legal assessment. So, the outside diligence team is not going to conduct a 1,000 control privacy audit of your organization. They, teams don't, do not typically have those kinds of resources for that kind of depth and diligence. But the team will ask about what I call the big headline privacy laws that 
everyone knows about or, or every insurer knows about. Uh, and those are California's comprehensive privacy laws, the comprehensive privacy laws in Colorado, Connecticut, Utah, um, and Virginia. Um, Colorado, Connecticut, and Utah laws are not online yet, but they will become issues later in the year and going forward into, uh, into next year, if that's when your exit event is timed for. TCPA and CAN spam, these are laws that govern text messaging and email marketing. And if you're operating in an area where you have regulated data, like financial data or health data or education data, you should expect questions about that. And the question will be, what have you done to assess the applicability of these laws to your business and to account for it? And if the answer is, we didn't know these laws exist, or we've done nothing to assess their applicability, that's a problematic answer. From the buyer's side, doing a diligence, you want to know that the seller has assessed these laws, that they've assessed them competently, ideally with outside counsel or a competent consultant, at least, and uh, that, that there's been some real consideration for how these major privacy laws will impact your business. Uh, another thing that sometimes comes up for some businesses, if you have uh, massive amounts of data processing that involves tracking individuals, there may be legal requirements for you to have conducted data protection impact assessments with respect to those aspects of your business. Data protection impact assessments have historically been a European law issue, but they're coming to the US. They're, they're now embedded in California's law. They're embedded in some of the other comprehensive laws. So they are things that US businesses need to start thinking about. Document, um, you need to document your privacy and security organization. So again, the buyer is not going to be able to do, uh, like I said, a you know, thousand control diligence, but they can always ask two or three questions to identify if you've assigned a CISO. Have you assigned somebody to be responsible for privacy compliance within your organization? Do you have reporting to the board of directors on the issue? Do you have um, any outside third-party review and audits? Do you have a process and system in place that uh, requires the company to pay attention to privacy and security on an ongoing basis with assigned responsibilities, perhaps hopefully defined policies that are updated regularly? If you don't, that's super easy for a buyer to spot, and you should expect that they're going to spot it every time. Uh, Third-party assessments, as I mentioned, always good if you can have some third-party assessments and review of your information security. And then uh, security breaches, you will always, always get a question, have you had unauthorized access or acquisition to personal data that you may handle? You need to be prepared for those questions. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. And then lastly, I'll highlight, uh, you'll, you will always, you should count on always, always being asked, have you ever had a regulator target your business in any way? Are you facing particular claims or lawsuits from, uh, from consumers? So from the tech diligence and IP side, Matt, what are some of the typical areas that you would cover? Um, so as outlined here on the screen, I think the first issue that your, your buyers are going to ask for is show us how it is that you own what you say you own. Show us the IP chain of title and the, just as a shorthand for the, the concept. Um, they're going to want to, they're going to say what's, they're going to ask you what's your historical and current practices related to securing title to your intellectual property assets. You know, do you, do you have a practice of using in-house developers? Do you have a practice of using outside contractors? They're going to want to know things like where they're located. Uh, one thing that people obviously uh, don't often contemplate is that assignments of, don't apply with respect to trade secrets. Confidentiality is actually how you transfer um, a trade secret. And so you, you not only need an intellectual property assignment, you also need confidentiality covenants for non-public information like source code, if that's an asset that your business has. Um, 
jurisdictional requirements. I, I mentioned they're going to want to know where the, the where the party is located. There are each jurisdiction will determine what the requirements are for the for the assignment. I'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about invalid uh, intellectual property assignments. Another area uh, that you can expect to be questioned on is outbound licenses. This is particularly true if you have a meaningful uh, amount of technology assets that you license out to third parties you know, as a revenue generating um, exercise. So things like license scope, you know, did you provide an overly broad license that would prevent the buyer from monetizing that customer in the future of perpetual license versus subscription license? Uh, is it a non-exclusive license or an exclusive license? Is it a terminable license or non-terminable license? All questions that the, the buyer is going to want to look at and make sure that there's contracting processes that reflect uh, the, the business model. Um, escrows, something that we'll talk a little bit more about later, but they'll want to know that you've protected the IP assets and that they haven't been unduly uh, jeopardized uh, in, in an escrow. Uh, assignment, I, I mentioned assignment, anti uh, change of control restrictions earlier. Uh, that'll be a big key item that they'll be that they will definitely dig in on. And then there are a few examples here listed of um, other restrictions, exclusivity, most favored uh, nations, customer requirements. Uh, in terms of inbound uh, licenses, most businesses, if not all businesses, have some inbound technology. Even if they're not a technology company themselves, they might be using Salesforce or Twilio or some other you know, hosting services from AWS. Uh, so they're going to want to look at those inbound services and make an assessment of how critical those suppliers or inbound uh, tech dependency might be. Um, license restrictions, if you've got data that you might be licensing from a third party, they're going to want to make an assessment of, okay, here's the data rights that you have from the data source. Here are the restrictions in that agreement. Are the practices of the company consistent with the rights that they've, that they've purchased under the license? Uh, that's, a, that's an issue we see trip, that trips up target companies quite a bit because they have a narrower license than they believe that they actually have and their practices aren't consistent. And so then you wonder if there's a license or service continuity with that, with that particular vendor. And, uh, and Matt, I mean, what, right, one easy thing to do is you pick some critical data dependency, you look at the inbound license, you look at some standard product or service offering you have to a client, you look at the outbound license where you're promising the, the same piece of data to a customer and you just, you like compare the two. Like I've seen deals go down in flames when you just do that exercise and it's like, huh, it looks like there's a mismatch. Right, is the yeah. outbound license yeah. broader than what the inbound license yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the vendor obviously is pricing their, their offering based on the scope of the license and you know, they find downstream users that are using it in a way that they didn't provide that's going to be a real problem for the target, and, and one that's easily spotted, as, as uh, Michael mentions. Open software, open source software issues, you, know, you could consider that as an inbound license, uh, but the considerations around that are, are, are different um, <clears throat> because there's not there's less of a continuity issue. There's no fees there, but there are special uh, terms in many open source licenses that can be problematic for your uh, technology and, and make it exposed. And we'll talk a little bit more about that one. Uh, as a special issue. All right, so um, so let's talk about some of these particular concrete issues in a little bit more depth. So I'll, I'll kick it off and, and we'll, we'll start with data breach. So you as the seller, here's the rule, right? As a seller, you need to disclose your data breaches even if the incident was minimal. A uh, couple reasons you need to disclose it. One, there will be broad reps in the purchase agreement. If it's any kind of commercial agreement, there will be broad representations in the purchase agreement against a data breach. Uh, and so what you do is you, you then typically will make a disclosure to the buyer on a separate disclosure schedule, identifying the data breaches that you've experienced with the theory being that when you do that, you've avoided fraud. The thought is if you don't make, if you make a representation and warranty that you don't have a data breach and you make no other, ex, no other disclosure 
And in fact, you have had a data breach, you've committed fraud, and you've you've just handed the, the buyer all kinds of claims against you in this transaction. You don't need to be doing that. So you may be asked to take the risk of any data breach you've had in the past, uh, but you, you don't want to not disclose it and have a fraud claim. Uh, the, the, the purchaser obviously will want to understand the risks that the incident proposes. They'll ask you a lot of follow-up questions about it. So the typical kinds of questions you'll be asked about your data breach that you need to be ready to answer are questions like, did you hire an outside forensic investigator? Did you have any outside legal review to assess your notice obligations or other obligations with respect to the incident? Did you make any notifications? Did you review your customer contracts when you assess that you didn't need to make notifications? A lot of people, I've seen a lot of people stop the analysis of whether you're obligated to make a notification by only analyzing state data breach laws. You also need to keep in mind that you may have made commitments to your customers that you'll notify them of data breaches. And so the question could arise, have you made those notifications that you promised to your customers or are you in breach of your customer contracts? Those are, the, those are the basic questions that you need to be able to answer. You also need to obviously be able to describe what the incident was, what data was impacted by the incident, what you did to remedy the incident. So it, you have those answers ready. Don't be scrambling. Um, expect to get those questions. Expect to be able to explain those points of how you responded to an incident. If the incident was minimal and properly handled, the risk, my experience is that the deal risk is low. Um, I, I've not seen a deal get sabotaged just because the company had, it, had a small incident and, and handled it. Um, what could sink a deal is a large incident that's not been properly handled where the attempt was maybe to, to minimize notification obligations or, or the like. Those kinds of incidents will generate a lot more scrutiny from the buyer and also from the insurer, if there is an insurer in the deal. And, and then as mentioned, obviously, if you, if you don't disclose the incident, the buyer is going to figure it out anyway after they close and they, they have access to all records in the business. Uh, and you're, you're just opening yourself up to, to issues post-closing if you haven't disclosed. So another uh, issue that we see very common that come up is that the, the intellectual property assignments and confidentiality covenants uh, for contributors are, are invalid. Um, as part of, as I mentioned, as part of the diligence, the purchaser is going to want a list of everybody, every worker uh, or outsourced company that has contributed to the development of intellectual property or technology for your company. Um, and they're going to want copies of executed documents. And that's where they're going to be checking, is this assignment um, effective to transfer title in everything that person or company created on behalf of the, the uh, company? One thing that people, including lawyers, uh, uh, don't get right is they look at the governing law of the contract and they say, okay, this is a, this worker is located in India, but the contract is California law. And they analyze the intellectual property assignment based on what California would require and not what India would require. But in fact, it's actually IP is local and it'll be local requirements that determine uh, the effectiveness and, the, and what needs to be done in terms of transferring title effectively from the, the creator to the, the company or the employer. Um, and so always, it, it, even in the United States, I should say there are nine states that have specific employee in an employee employer context have employee protection laws in place that require limiting the assignments so they're not overly broad and they wouldn't reach into things that the employee does on his own time with his own with his own resources uh, and on his own dime uh, so the assignments don't capture those uh, and then will actually invalidate your assignment if it is uh, uh, overly broad and so you want to make sure that if you've got workers 
employees specifically in one of those nine states, you've got the, an assignment that is appropriately scoped for that particular state, as well as there are notices that have to be included at the time of contracting. And then, as I mentioned, um, uh, each jurisdiction is going to have its own requirements. In the United States, that's a present tense assignment. Uh, employee hereby assigns to employer, right? Not employee promises to assign, employee agrees to assign, employee shall assign. It's employee hereby assigns. That's a U.S. jurisdictional requirement. And that requirement is actually in, in, in a lot of jurisdictions that we've looked at, Canada, most of Europe, India. But uh, at drawing on the example of India, they have additional requirements. Like you have to have a territorial uh, uh, specification in the assignment, you know, worldwide, all worldwide. If there's not a territorial assignment, it's only in India. Uh, also, there has to be a duration a duration to the assignment. It has to be perpetual, right? That's typically what people want. They expect that the assignment will be perpetual. In India, if you fail to include perpetual, it's only for five years and it reverts back to the uh, assigner. Those are issues that purchasers will be looking at. They'll ask questions when I'm, when I'm representing a buyer as a DU local counsel for the worker who's in Bulgaria. Right, um, and then we, and then, and then it'll be up to my client to decide whether or not we want to hire local counsel to look at those assignments. Uh, but it's not uncommon at all that um, if we find invalid assignments, you're very risk adverse. Maybe a strategic buyer is going to require those to be um, cleaned up pre pre close. Uh, so you have to can go back to all your employees now and make them. Execute yeah. a new document. Everybody has to execute yeah. a new document. Even sales, even people that the really risk adverse ones will make even the salespeople sign new assignments. You don't, to Michael's point earlier, you want you may not want the key, the transaction and, and the existence of it available to everybody in the company. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, if you have a little bit less risk adverse of a of a uh, buyer, you know, they might dig in. And you know, what I would do is say. What did this person, when did this person work at the company? And what were they doing for the company? If they're a salesperson, maybe you're willing to let that go. But if they are the CTO that was involved, that's a co-founder who was there from the beginning, you can bet you can pretty much expect that you're gonna have to clean that up pretty close. So all right, so we're running a little slow. So I'm gonna whip through this slide. Uh, the, the point is your buyer may. Um, need data to be transferred post-closing in order to appropriately support the transaction. You may need personal data to be transferred across borders, so from Europe to the United States, for example. If that's the case, the buyer is likely to ask you to enter into additional data transfer agreements, which is something you should be prepared to manage. That means, in terms of preparing for your exit event, again, you need to think about notices, make sure you haven't made representations to employees or to consumers, promising the data won't be transferred, for example. You need to make sure you have, have contracts that don't block the data transfer that your buyer is going to need in order for the deal to work. Arguably, this issue is something for, for the buyer to spot, but it's the seller should be prepared to support the buyer on this kind of post-closing data transfer issue in those ways. Let's talk about open source, man. Yeah, open source software, uh, you know, increasingly common to see uh, if you there's any meaningful amount of software assets that you'll you'll get open source questions. People, the buyer is going to want to know what's in the software, you know, not just commercial components, but but open source components as well. And so it, it would behoove you to track, and you'd be surprised how often target companies do not know what's in their software or struggle to or scramble to, to put together a list of what's in there, that, which oftentimes involves buying a third-party service to scan it and audit the code. Um, so it, as, a, uh, as a deal preparation point, it makes sense to make sure that you're maintaining what is being called today, which is a relatively new terminology, a software bill of materials, right? That tracks, here's the third-party and open source components we have, here are the licenses associated with it. And at least as it relates to open source, they're gonna to wanna to know uh, whether it's been modified or whether it's been distributed. 
the, the key point that many purchasers are going to be looking for with respect to open source software is whether or not there's a, been a, co a so called copy left uh, issue that's been triggered. What that what that means is is that the open source uh, code that's being used is subject to a license that could attach to what you would consider the proprietary code. Um, and that would mean that the, you effectively you have open source your proprietary software. And if you uh, then it could be made available under the terms of this open source free of charge without the right to prevent further distributions of that uh, open source code. UPL is the, is the very common one. Um, distri distribution versus hosted is, is a key um, element of whether or not there is an open source or copy left issue that's been triggered. Uh, at least as it relates to GPL, there are, even if you're a pure SaaS provider, your technology is made available as a SaaS, uh, there are open source licenses, uh, a FARO, general public license, AGPL, that will consider a, a SaaS deployment, a distribution under its terms. And, and we see that come up very commonly. Uh, the other thing to know about um, open source and copyleft issues is if one has arisen, those rights are have uh, basically attached and they're not irreversible. So if you have version one of your software that has a copy left issue, uh, you can remediate it and you can take out the problematic open source, but that version one, you know, so therefore you have version two, but the version one would still have to be required uh, to be made available under the, under the particular open source license. So, you, you know, we, when we see this in, uh, in our practice, uh, Purchases require remediation and say, okay, we've got a problematic GPL license component that's been distributed with proprietary source. There's substantial risk that proprietary software is going to have to be made available under the GPL license. We need to remove and replace that GPL license, even though that doesn't fix the issue looking backwards. It does fix the issue on a go forward basis. So that version two, version three are going to be uh, protected from being disclosed under the license. Uh, so consider the remediation efforts. They can be significant depending on how poor that uh, that open source license is to the to the offering. If it is, it could be significant engineering effort, uh, both in terms of time and cost. You may have to buy a commercial component. Um, uh, we've uh, in a in a past deal, we uh, identified an open source component that was being used under the GPL license since 2016. Uh, we confidentially reached out to the vendor who also made this component available as a commercial license, and it became a negotiation of how far back were we going to have to pay the commercial commercial license. We ended up negotiating it to 2019, so we got a few years off of off of what they should have been paying all along, but it was still a six-figure bill that the, the seller ultimately had to, to, to eat. So post-closing data use. So this is a really hard issue for sellers. It, it, it comes up sometimes that you have a buyer who's planning some really radically new use of data from your business. Maybe that would be surprising to consumers, maybe under new branding. You as the seller, it's, it's very hard to anticipate if that's going to be the case for your, for your buyer. You can to a limited extent, try to build a certain amount of flexibility into contracts and into privacy notices. But frankly, the way privacy law is developing, it's getting harder and harder to build in completely wide open, broad flexibility with respect to your use of data. So, so this becomes a hard issue. So how does this issue get resolved when you're facing this issue? You've built your business one way, you've determined that this is how we use data, you've constructed contracts and notices around some basic set of assumptions for how you use data, and you have a buyer who plans to do different things with your data and wants, uh, wants you to support it in some way. So the buyer will ask in that case for, uh, may ask you to sign covenants supporting their future use. They want you to take the risk for what they're going to do with the data. Um, it will say, well, the, the wording doesn't matter, but but the point of the wording is is to allocate some risk to you as the seller for their future use of your data. Usually you as the seller need to resist the strong forms 
of those kinds of, of warranties because it just doesn't make sense for you to take that risk. You arguably should not be answerable for subsequent novel uses uh, of data by the buyer. Something more limited, however, may be reasonable, may be negotiated, perhaps to do with use of data as it has been used in the past with respect to those existing customers. So, um, so that's that's post-closing data use, something that you generally handle uh, on the contractual side, maybe a little bit, you can do some preparation for it, but you need to contract around that carefully so that you don't end up with a post-closing issue where you end up holding a lot of risk and liability for the buyer's novel use of your data. Let's talk about tech escrows. Tech escrows. So if you've got... Um software or technology assets that the buyers don't want to know um, whether you have actually escrowed any of those tech, any of those assets uh, or have an obligation. Usually there's a rep that you have not done that and you have to disclose, disclose that. Uh, you want to avoid, uh, my general advice to clients is avoid escrowing your, your assets if that at all possible. I've got a few uh, sub bullets there. I won't, I won't dive into, but happy to talk to anybody in more depth about how you can avoid uh, escrow in your technology. Um, what we see is that there's often uh, overly broad escrow rights when there are escrows. The release, release events are very broad. Uh, the rights that the uh, beneficiary to the account, you know, usually if the customer or partner, uh, are, are broader than what they would otherwise be entitled to. You don't have a right to sort of uh, close out close out the escrow account once the once the uh, agreement with the partner or customer or the beneficiary is terminates, right? And so I listed here a few things uh, that you want to if you do have escrows, uh, doing these four at the bottom, these four sub bullets will save you a lot of headaches with with buyers. Um, <clears throat> You know, recently we uh, were in the process of representing a buyer that uh, the target company had agreed to escrow its technology with a very large uh, customer organization. And when we looked at the escrow, it was uh, the the rights uh, that the the beneficiary had were very expansive, close to ownership. Well, I mean, not quite ownership, but very close to ownership, and they were perpetual and to the point where this customer the beneficiary was a competitive risk to uh, the, my client, the buyer. Uh, and so we had to have a negotiation. You know, we, you know, the, we had to have a negotiation with that large customer to, to, to amend uh, the escrow provisions. And ultimately we're not able to come uh, to an agreement about what the deal should be. And it actually killed the deal uh, for that target company. So do, do be careful when you're escrowing uh, your technology and you're not giving out so much rights that uh, that it's going to scare buyers away. All right, let's talk about data sales. So this is an issue. Uh, get the next slide. So this is an issue that's emerged in the last few years in the U.S. in a big way. So it started with California's law enacting a broad definition of what counts as the sale of data. In their view, any exchange of personal data for money or other valuable consideration counts as a sale. So if you think about that for a moment, suddenly that means potentially that vendor relationships are a sale of data, right? Um, it means any kind of provision of data where there's not, uh, where there's value in the commercial relationship, which is every commercial relationship, is potentially a sale of data. Now, California carved out some exceptions if you have a vendor and you limit their rights to, to, to do, use the data for any purpose except providing services, that may not be a sale. Um, but the point is that the concept is broader than you think under these new comprehensive state privacy laws. And the result is that you may be selling or brokering data if you are renting or selling lists for money, okay, that's the easy case. If you are operating a data platform, right, that involves exchanges with third parties, if you're enriching or enhancing personal data that you've acquired, 
and then somehow publishing that enhancement or that enrichment. If you're engaged in what I call rich reporting to customers, so this happens where your company as a value add to your B2B customer decides we're going to generate these awesome reports that tell our business to business customer all sorts of things about whatever it is we're managing for them. And we're going to make those, we're going to, we're going to juice those reports up and make them extra good uh, by ingesting some additional data that we have. And it turns out that some of that additional data that you have relates to identifiable individuals. And now suddenly the rich analytic reporting that's that awesome value add for your customers is actually a data sale. And you need to, uh, and, and you're now selling data or brokering data. Um, cookies and analytics on websites is increasingly becoming an issue. Running an ad network, you might have guessed, but that counts as a data sale, I think, under law currently. Um, any kind of, if you're ingesting data from your business customer and you're doing anything with it besides providing services to that business customer, that may be, uh, th th you may have put your customer in the position of selling data to you, which is a different kind of issue than you selling data, but it's still an issue to be aware of. So if you're in this, so what you wanna to do to prepare for this issue is one, structure that your business to the extent you can so that you're not selling or brokering data. That may be more or less possible depending on your business. If, you, if your business is in the data sale, uh, is selling data and is brokering data, then you need to have a compliance plan for that. You, need, you may need to be offering opt-outs to consumers you may need to have additional content in your notice. You may need to make registrations with state authorities in California or Vermont around your data brokering activity. The point is you wanna have a story to tell the buyer about how you have managed your data sales to ensure that you're acting in compliance with law. Uh, manage, let's talk about the next issue, uh, which is managed communications. I see this with SaaS companies all the time. They have a messaging component on their SaaS platform that lets their business customers message consumers. I, I, I am still shocked at how often people are surprised to get questions about that. But the truth is I'm not the only one on the buy side who would ask questions about that. Insurers also routinely ask questions about this. So you, you need to be aware that when you have that embedded communication functionality in your SaaS platform, you have invited scrutiny under the communications laws that I talked about earlier, like the text messaging law or email marketing law. And there are now questions that are begged about who's acquired the consent. Um, is it the right kind of consent? How, how have you allocated risk and liability on this issue with your customers? Have you allocated it at, at all? Do you have a defensible way to say that the messages sent from your platform don't are not your messages, but are your customers' messages? So things like who owns the account from which the message is actually sent may, may become important questions. So these are all things to be aware of if you have a messaging component in your platform and you should be prepared for questions in this area. Yeah, one thing to add to that too, that's sort of a novel thing that's been coming out. If you have chat features on your website, if you have a chat bot on your website, a new thing in the last year, and I expect purchasers are going to be picking up on this, is uh, do, does your vendor that who provides that chat feature have live real-time access to the conversations between the user and uh, the chat bot or a live agent that might be on the other side of that chat? There's some new legal theories, wiretapping theories that have been coming out of California in the past year or so that plaintiff lawyers are, are poking around to see uh, where there's an opportunity for them. So if you've got live chat features, consider that uh, as well. Um, service and license continuity, I touched on this a little bit earlier. You know, obviously your purchasers are gonna wanna know who the material suppliers are, if there's critical tech dependencies. And, and what they're going to want to know 
is do you have a contract with them first? You'd be surprised how often that is an issue. And then if you do, uh, does the contract adequately contemplate uh, an, a responsible unwinding of the relationship if and when that occurs? Um, you know, that includes things like long, longer termination periods, uh, business continuity requirements, uh, mandatory dispute resolution processes before anybody can take legal actions like terminating a contract, uh, mandatory wind down periods. If you've got downstream dependencies on this on the supplier, you promised a particular feature in your offering that you're licensing from a third party, you're going to make sure that you've got uh, uh, appropriate wind down phase. Ideally, the length of your customer contracts in effect at that time, but that's a subject of negotiation. Um, we we engage we bought a uh, company last year that's platform was completely licensed in from a third party supplier, uh, and the company literally could not operate without this licensed in uh, platform. Um, it come come to find out in the diligence that there was no contract at all with this. It was a handshake deal that had gone back with a family business in Ireland for many years, uh, and it was a and in the context of the broader deal trying to get that deal in place so that we could close was a, an avoidable deal headache. Um, the, the deal ended in a closing, but uh, it, it was an unnecessary stress to the, to the parties. All right, and last slide, uh, last substantive slide. So privacy notices, I've kind of talked about this a bit already through, throughout the hour. Um, it's very easy for buyers to spot issues with your privacy notices. Don't make sweeping promises not to share data with third parties and then fail to, to carve out an exception for the sale of your company. That will always be an issue uh, for the buyer. It is a legal risk. Um, Understand that the promises you make in a privacy notice are binding. They can't easily be retroactively changed. So the, the, how you interpret that is going to depend on your context and your business, but you need to be thinking about that with your counsel when you're drafting your privacy notice to um, ensure that you aren't unduly restricting the ability of the company to operate or, or sell. So. Um, so I think we're right at time 